Let's talk about a few misconceptions about comparative advantage. One of the big arguments that you hear opponents of free trade use is that free trade is only beneficial if your country is strong enough to stand up to foreign competition. So you'll hear people say, what if, what if we can't produce anything cheaply enough to be able to compete in the, the world um, trade scene? What we know, even from the basic farmer-rancher example, is that trade is not, gains from trade, is not based upon absolute advantage. Gains from trade comes from comparative advantage. And one of the basic things you realize real quickly is that it's impossible to have a comparative advantage in everything. You could have the absolute advantage in everything. But it's not possible to have the comparative advantage in everything. Probably the more useful version of that is that it's also not possible to have a comparative advantage in nothing. And so what that means is it is not possible for you to not be able to produce something cheaply enough to compete with other countries. You have to. By definition, you have to have the comparative advantage in something. So that argument is used by people who unintentionally are, are focusing on the wrong thing. It's natural to focus on absolute advantage rather than comparative advantage. Another argument that you tend to hear people make is that foreign trade or trade with another country is unfair if it's based upon low wages in that country. This was an argument that was used when, when uh, NAFTA was being discussed, the, the North American Free Trade Agreement. You hear it a lot. And, and actually, it's an argument that you tend to hear labor unions use. Um, and we'll talk about why they might use that argument um, a little bit later in, in the class. But um, it's an argument made by people who don't understand or don't stop to consider the fact that the world is not a zero-sum game. That Making that argument assumes that somehow the trade is going to benefit the other country without benefiting you. But what we've seen is that the neat thing about specialization and trade, whether it's trade between countries or whether it's trade between two people, the neat thing about it is that it's a positive-sum game. By trading, by specializing in what you have the comparative advantage in and trading with somebody else or your country trading with another country, you're actually able to increase the size of the economic pie. And there's more, that means there's more for everybody. Now, the terms of the trade determine how much more each person gets. And so we'll talk about that later on. There may be times if if uh, you've agreed to a trade unintentionally that, that you didn't think through, you could be taken advantage of. But in general, that's not an argument against free trade. Another argument against free trade that, that you tend to hear is the exploitation argument or the sweatshop argument. And so you'll hear people talk about um, the idea that we shouldn't trade or we shouldn't allow our, our businesses to um, have products produced in another country where um, young people are producing them or where the work conditions are not good and, and uh, where there are sweatshops. And so let's talk a little bit about that because understanding why that argument is not necessarily a good one depends upon understanding how relative wages get determined in a country compared to another country. So if we think about um, the example that we have been using, if we think about home and foreign, we've got home specializing in cheese and foreign specializing in wine. So let's think our way through that quickly. So in our example that we've been using, foreign is specializing in wine. And what we saw there is that it takes three hours to produce a unit of wine so workers are going to earn one-third the value of a unit of wine per hour. Every three hours, they earn the value of a unit of wine. So in one hour, they earn one-third the value of a unit of wine. So 
let's write that out. Workers earn one third the value of a unit of wine. So we assumed in our example that the relative price of cheese to wine was equal to one. So we can convert that into the relative amount in terms of cheese that they would earn. So workers are going to earn one-third the value of a pound of cheese. Let's say a unit of cheese. Now that's if workers, if people in foreign trade with people in home. This is the condition of foreign workers. They're going to earn a third the value of a unit of wine. Since our relative price of cheese and wine is one, that means they're going to earn a third the value of a unit of cheese if they trade. But let's suppose that people in foreign make the argument that we're taking advantage, or excuse me, people in home make the argument that we're taking advantage of foreign workers and uh, they're working in sweatshop conditions, so we shouldn't trade with them. And let's suppose we choose not to trade with them. So suppose we don't trade. Let's think about now the situation that puts foreign workers in. So now what we've got is a situation that the value, where the value of a third gallon of wine is equal to one-sixth of a pound of cheese. And I'll explain why here in a second. So now, in foreign, the value of one-third gallon of wine is one-sixth of a pound of cheese. And let's think about why that's going to be the case. So here's the explanation for why that's the case. And, and, and this is something that you may find yourself having to do. It's something that, that is not obvious if I were to just write this or say this and go on for most people, including myself, if I just instantly saw that, this step wouldn't be um, necessarily obvious to me. So let's think about why that has to be true. So we know that in foreign, the opportunity cost of one gallon of wine is one half pound of cheese. Squeeze that in there. The opportunity cost of one gallon of wine is a half pound of cheese. So if I want to convert this and figure out the opportunity cost of a third gallon of wine, I need to divide that one by three to turn it into a one-third. But remember that golden rule of algebra, whatever you do to one thing, you've got to do to everything else. So if I want to convert that to one-third, I've got to divide it by three. I also have to divide that number by three. So that tells me that the opportunity cost of a third gallon of wine is one half divided by three is the same as one half multiplied by one third. That's one sixth of a pound of cheese. So that's where that comes from. What that means is that the wage for workers is going to be cut in half, right? What they earn, if foreign doesn't trade with home, what foreign workers the condition that they're in is that their wage goes from one-third to one-sixth of a pound of cheese. So their standard of living is cut in half. Here, here's the basic point of this discussion. There's nothing wrong with thinking about the working conditions of workers in other countries. And in many cases, they're deplorable. The way you fix that is not to eliminate free trade.
if you eliminate free trade, if you eliminate trade with that country, those workers are even worse off. So you're doing something that, that worsens their condition. The remedies for the, how we fix the deplorable working conditions are to think about maybe changing um, um, rules in that country or encouraging that country to change its rules. There, there are other ways to fix that, but going after free trade is not the way to do that. That, that only makes them worse off. What we need to do now is we need to go through a numerical example and I think you'll see that all of this stuff that it's taking, taking this long to kind of discuss, it's all actually very easy to go through. So let's do that.